Hello, guys, and welcome. Everyone deserves a chance. Today has a, a very uh, interesting guest, Richard Zimmerman. We met on a meetup recently. We don't have a long relationship, but our conversation uh, dragged us uh, into a world that is not too common or open to everybody. So thank you, Richard, for coming over. I really appreciate your time. Whatever you're going to give us today is going to be more than enough. Thank you. All right, Richard, I am not going to be able to do justice if I'm going to present you because, like I said earlier, I don't really know too many things about you. But after our conversation, I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? This is definitely a subject that is going to interest a lot of people. And please tell us a couple of things about yourself. Okay. Yep. Obviously, my name is Richard Zimmerman. The company that I work for, the agency that I work for is Subert and Associates. What's unique about Subert is they are um, owned, privately owned, so they are not a part of a big conglomerate. So there's a lot of great relationships that we're able to continue to develop uh, inside the agency. The agency is coming up on 50 years of being in business, starting off as a door, the owner was a door to door insurance salesman. If you can even imagine that still today, that could even be possible. And again, but so that's nearly 50 years ago. 32 years ago, they began the bond division of the security bond division of the agency. And that's primarily where my focus is. We do all lines of insurance benefits, any kind of life insurance that you can even, any insurance you can imagine, we provide that. Um, but my, myself, I focus in on, on the bond division. And I, what I wanted to share is what I kind of, some of the conversation that I'd had with you, which is really some of the unknowns about bonding. And what I have found speaking at different events, the way I have found that people really didn't recognize about bonding. So it, bonding, a surety bond is unlike an insurance program where an insurance is a two-party where you would place a claim and they pay it. And if you have too many claims, they're going to bump up your your premiums, right? And insurance is a very sensitive subject right now for everybody because everyone's paying significantly more than they were even a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. So that's as a result of some losses across the country, Hurricanes here in Florida caused to spread that that cost across the country. So everyone's paying for any type of natural disasters, things that are happening out there. Bonding, however, is a three-party agreement, and that is between you, the let's call it a contractor, you the contractor, the insurance company, or what's called a surety in the bond world, and the person who's requiring the bonding from you. And the difference is, is the if in fact a claim needed to be made, the the owner of the project would make the claim on your bond, and the surety would make sure that the performance and payment of everything happens. Bonding starts off with a bid bond, and I always like to early on. I want to I always like to put this out there because most people don't realize that bonding is free. All and, right, so. Hold on one second before we get there. Yes, this is the conversation we have, but I want to dial it back one second okay, so I okay. can give a little bit of context to, to the people watching. So I own a small business, and while I was going through the bidding process, I want to expand the business, right? I want to grow it. So now I'm looking at a bigger project. We're looking into insurance. We're looking into expanding the insurance, making sure that we get the right coverage for our business. So when I was looking through the application process, one of the applications that came back I had a question in it. Are you bondable? And first thing I did, I picked up the phone. I called the insurance lady that we use. I'm like, can you please send me a letter that we are bondable so I can send over to these guys? And I thought I'm talking to my commercial insurance broker that I had, and she knows everything about it. And she came back to me and she said, listen, we need uh, more specifics, like what kind of bond. And this is where the conversation started. So then fast forward, I didn't look too much into it. That was the only conversation I had. Then I picked up another application and this uh, surfaces on contracts, even under 750,000 as a regular contractor, general contractor. It happens that we're electricians, but this conversation is applicable for any contractor, right? And over $750,000, which are the bigger jobs, 
those definitely require bonding. So I, when I walked around on these vans of people driving around, insured, bound and insured, right? They all have it. I bet 90% of them have no idea what bound and even means. So right. this is this is where I'm like, okay, now I need help. And luckily I met you and you were able to explain it. And now that it's in a, in the context, this is when you need a bounding, when you're applying for a job, when you're bidding for a job. And the job, that at the very get-go, you need to have all these documents in place. And the fact that it's free, I had no idea. The first, my broker told me I have to pay for it. He says, no, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg, depending on the amount that you want the bounding for. I'm like, okay, God damn it. Now I got to find an investor or put my own money at risk. Mm-hmm. So let me clarify two two different things that the part of that conversation. So what you're seeing on the side of a van is not, it, it's a different kind of bond. It's a license and permit bond. Okay. And those are rare. Most of the time, they're pretty cheap. They could be hundreds of dollars to maybe no more than $1,500. And it depends on what level of pursuit of projects you're going to be looking for. And they're typically required by the state, not by someone who you're doing the work for, right? So a license and permit bond would be if you did something wrong, someone could make a claim on your bond. Um, So a lot of times the state will say, okay, if you're going to do work up to 200,000, I need you to get a license and permit bond for up to $200,000 on a single contract. Okay, so that's different than what I'm trying, and there is a cost associated with a license and permit bond, but it is fairly cheap. However, uh, a bid payment and performance bond, those are different. Okay. And that's the part that's free. And this is what shocks everyone when I tell them, but if done properly, the bid bond should not, you should not be charged for the bid bond, but I want to clarify something on a bid bond and how it reads. So oftentimes when you look at a contract and they want, let's say, for example, a 5% bid bond, Okay, it's going to say 5% bid bond required. A lot of people go, oh, this is a $200,000 project. I got to put up 10 grand just to bid this. That's not what that is. That 5% is the penalty, the maximum penalty that you would pay if you bid the project, you were the low bidder, and you decided not to do the project. So let's say go back to the $200,000 project, and you decided, oops, I didn't estimate this right. This is a $400,000 project. I'm not losing $200,000 to do this project. I'm going to walk away from it. Your maximum penalty would be that 5%. Now, when I say maximum, if somebody else bid the project at $201,000, then your maximum penalty would be the $1,000, the difference between you and the next closest bidder. So that is a maximum penalty. It's not something that you have to pay up front. Oftentimes, bid bonds will also be a dollar amount. They might be 100000 or 50000 depending upon the contract size. So again, that's just the maximum penalty. If you started, the, you, know, you bid the process, you were awarded the project, you were the low, and you said, oops, I don't want to, I can't do this project for whatever reason. I always like to point that out. But if you're at, with the right agency, there's no cost for a bid bond. So we don't charge for, some agencies charge a a nominal amount, but we don't charge for bid bonds. So second is your payment and performance bond. Once you're awarded the contract, typically you're given anywhere from 10 to, can be a number of more days, but 10 days is a general time frame that you would re- be required to provide that payment and performance bond for the, let's go back to the 200,000. So to educate what a payment and performance bond is, it's pretty simple. The payment part is to make sure that they, the, the bid, the bond guarantees that you're going to pay everyone involved, any suppliers. So the, let's call it the state or the city doesn't want a lien on that project because you didn't pay one of your suppliers. You didn't pay one of your subs. Okay, so that's the payment part. The performance part is to make sure that you perform the project exactly as the contract reads. If you sign off on change orders, that you'll do the change orders, and you'll do it just as they're read. So if for some reason you decided to run off to Costa Rica and fish and not finish the project, the surety, the insurance company, will come in. They will hire what's called a takeover contractor, which generally is way more expensive than if you finished the project yourself, but they'll hire a takeover contractor, and that takeover contractor will finish the project, whatever that cost is, combined with whatever the surety's costs were to 
pursue you, you would be responsible for that amount of money. Again, but there's no cost to get the payment of performance bond if done properly because the person or the company, the state, whomever is requiring you to bond, they are the ones that pay for the bond. So if that would be a line item in your estimate and no cost for the bid bond, no cost for the payment of performance bond because the owner that's requiring this bond from you pays for it. So there's no cost to, to be bonded and there's no cost to set it up. There's no cost to maintain it. The only thing that you have to do is periodically provide financial information, update financial information to continue to hold on to the bond line for as long as it takes. Yes, that's very nice to know these details. And it's even though we are doing business, we're going that route, we're learning these things on the fly because they're not readily available, this information. I always, always have the impression that I have to pay for it. I have nobody actually explain me, not even my insurance agent explain me how it really works. Everything was based on, yeah, we got to see the numbers in order to issue that bond. But the conversation of setting it up, it wasn't there. So sure. as a one-on-one, that's what we need to do. We need to set it up first, right? That's right. the first thing. So we got to pull. What's involved into, you said pulling the financials. What are actually, uh, what are you looking for? The- yeah. So let's talk about levels of support and kind of, you know, what, what a surety looks for, what we as an agency try to help you uh, hold your hand through. So depending upon the, the size of support, if you are looking at a contract up to $750,000 and you have reasonably good credit, meaning 650 or higher, preferably over 730 score personal credit, then you can get bonding almost instantaneously within a 30-minute process and you're uh, up to 750000 on just a two-page application. Once we jump from 750000 anything above 750000 and below $2 million, then you would need internal financial statements, which would include a balance sheet, income statement, aging payables, and receivables on an accrual basis, preferably. If they're on a cash basis, we can work around that, but a recommended accrual basis. Personal financial statement, which would just list any assets that you have. If you don't have assets, it's not that doesn't preclude you from getting bonding. It just w- is helpful if you do. And then bank reference where you could show deter- could, we could determine what cash was in the company. And then based on that, they can make a determination of what's called working capital. And working capital is not just cash. Working capital is anything that's on your balance sheet, cash, marketable securities and accounts receivables add up to be your what's called current assets. If you have a lot of materials, sometimes they will give you some credit for that up to 50% if you are turning those materials in a 12-month period. So you can get that some value there. So that's what's called your current assets. Now, you've dropped down on that balance sheet and you look at current liabilities, that's going to be your accounts payables. That's going to be any short term, the the next 12 months of payments on any long-term debt. So if you have a truck that you have a five-year note on, 12 months of that five years would be listed as a current liability. Same thing for a lot of people got the EIDL loan from the SBA during the, the pandemic. That's a 30-year, typically 30-year loan. 12 months of payments would, would be considered a current liability. So if you take those current liabilities, and there's a line item that says total current liabilities, if everything is categorized and charted properly, you would take the current assets and you would minus current liabilities. And let's say that is $100,000. That $100,000 in, in a standard market, you would be able to get somewhere between 10 and 15 times that amount in bond support. And so that means, let's just call it 15, but at 100,000, you can do the math, you're talking about $1.5 million. So now that that being said, that doesn't mean you can automatically go out and get a $1.5 million job. You would need to have done a, pro- a project up somewhere around the $750,000 range in order to get a $1.5 million bond. So basically, Stewarties don't like to go beyond twice your largest project. 
Okay. So if you if your largest project was two hundred thousand, they'd like to see you around four hundred thousand max. That's not, it's not a line drawn in the sand per se, because if it's if you said, hey, I got one for five hundred thousand, and this is why it makes sense, then you would make you would make it make sense to your agent, and your agent would make it make sense to the surety. So that's what our job is to make sure that we get you all the support that you need, and also to guide you and how to continue to grow your business. I knew an example. It wasn't my contractor. I wish it were, but I knew a contractor first bond out of the box. They did a $75,000 bond. Nearly 14 years later, they're doing, they'll probably do $280 million this year. You can exponentially grow because if you do a 200,000, then you can do a 400,000, then you can do an 800,000 and on, and eventually you can get into those millions. And that's how you grow it. And methodically growing it is super important. But let's talk about last thing, which is if you pursue a project over $2 million, now we're talking about getting a CPA involved where whereby we are needing a CPA prepared reviewed financial statement. So it's not that just that they're reviewing it, they have to actually endorse it and make some attestations on what they saw and there's note sections and everything. So there's a, it's a little bit more detailed and the CPA has to be a CPA that can do reviews. So some all CPAs are not created equal. Highly recommend if you're in the construction industry that you get a construction accountant. So they know better how to categorize everything and make sure that you look the best for a surety. Let me so, ask you a quick one here. I want to give you a curveball. How do you find these construction CPAs? Because to me, this is news. I know that when you do real estate, you want to find a CPA that has, uh, that he's an investor that has assets. But how do you find a construction? You just go ask around, do you own a company that does construction? Or is there a specialized way of looking for them or just by networking? in Florida, which is where I'm located, but also throughout the country. And nowadays, you can get a CPA in in Florida to do your accounting in Alaska. I have accounts in Alaska that are done by a, a Florida CPA. You don't really necessarily have to have a local CPA. Some people like to be able to sit down with their accountant, but it's with Zoom and everything else now, you can, you can sit down on a Zoom call. But the a construction accountant... What I generally suggest to people is to say at least 50% of their accounting that they do is construction. That's how you find a good construction. Like the ones that I recommend, that's all they do is construction. But if you're dealing locally, try to find like how many of your clients, what percentage of your clients do construction so that they, you really know that they understand the construction and the surety industry and how to portray everything on the financials. So the level of paper that you get from your accountant is super important in bonding. So, Yeah, that's very important. Thank you very much for, for letting us know. Yeah, it's important because I have to do just that. I have to figure it out how do I get to the right accountant that's going to be able to support me in this journey. Because other than that, I have a bookkeeper. She's doing most of my stuff, but they ended up doing everything. They do taxes, they do all the filing for it, they do all this and that. And the accountant just oversees a little bit of it. But the accountant, I never asked him this very important question. And yeah. yeah. Are you able to do reviews? A lot of accountants don't want to do them because of the additional liability. They have to carry extra insurance. So that's why a reviewed financial statement is going to be more expensive than just getting your taxes done. Now, on that note, if you're a small contractor, there is no need to pay a lot of money for a review. There are construction CPAs that will do it for a reasonable price. You don't need a big fancy office that they're in that you're paying for by doing your review. There are accountants out there that are more independent, less massive amounts of bookkeepers and everything on staff. So they can, it can be reasonable. So just to give you a ballpark of pricing, if you're a small contractor doing less than, say, $20 million a year in revenue, you can get a, you should be able to get a, a CPA review for somewhere around seven or $8,000. If you're over 20, you might need a more sophisticated CPA firm, but you should never really be paying more than about fifteen to 20000 I have seen some CPAs that will charge more than that, and I don't think that it's, it's worth the money. And they're generally in those big fancy offices. So, this time they have a big overhead. I say that all the time. 
Exactly. Richard, thank you so much uh, for your time. How do we uh, reach out to you? How can we find you? Is there a direct line that you use, uh, something that you want to provide us? Yeah, that'd be great. So my cell phone number, which I, I answer, unfortunately, but or, unfortunately, night and day, is 561-676-2322. So that's if you want to reach me by landline or cell phone. And then my email address is my first initial, which is R, my last name, which is Z-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N, Zimmerman, so R Zimmerman, at Subert, which is spelled S-E-U-B as in boy, E-R-T, dot com. So R Zimmerman at Subert dot com. Either one of those will get to me and I'll respond quickly. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate it. Yes, definitely. Have a great day, great rest of the week, and thank you for coming on our podcast. Everyone deserves a chance. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Thanks so much. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.